Here we go. Joe Greco, welcome to the show. How are you? Good, Gordon. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Joe, why don't you take a couple of minutes and introduce yourself and your company, what you do and how you do it? Sure. So my name is Joe Greco. My company is Palio Inc., named after the famous annual horse race in Siena, Italy. Uh, a lot of analogies are drawn to that. We focus primarily, though, not on horse racing, but we do focus on professional development and performance coaching. And the motif around getting in the race really applies, as we all know, identifying not only what skills you have to be competitive in the race, to, de to determine who the competition is, to understand what the rules are, and to really understand the prize that's at stake when you are identifying and, and after uh, your competition in the race that you're in. That's great. And, and Joe's tagline for his company is get in the race if anybody wants to look that up. And I think it's, it's a great tagline because it, it gives you the imagery of you know, racing, um, competition, winning, drive, all those sorts of things that I think a lot of entrepreneurs need sometimes to have the whip cracked over their back to get them kind of going to get in the race. So Joe, who, who are your typical clients? And maybe that'd be a good starting point to kind of unpack what you really do for them and with them. Sure. Well, in this, in this particular uh, economy right now, we're seeing a lot more interest from financial services. So in particular, money managers, RIAs, family office, uh, even in the private equity space. So a little bit more of the alternative assets where there is transition, there are liquidity opportunities, there is some type of succession planning that is needed. And they need to work through these conversations, not just internally with the partnership or the stakeholders, but also with the leadership team and making sure that everybody's on the same page so they understand who's potentially going to move through the, uh, you know, the ranks and get to uh, the succession uh, timeout. That's, I'm just a freaking mess on that one. That's all right. She'll cut that out. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So should I just ask the question again? Oh man, who are your clients? Let me give you the quick answer. All right, so Joe, who, 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 so Joe, who are your typical clients that are engaging with you? Sure. These days, most clients hover around financial services. So you have RIAs, family office, wealth advisors, as well as many in the tech space. And because of the growth of technology, as we know, being at home or partially at home and remote for so long, uh, there's been an explosion of interest in that industry. And those people need to really sharpen up their leadership and their management skills. So leadership and management, those are the two key areas that you're helping coach these folks through? Yeah, with the advisors, it really drills into how can you handle a critical conversation? So the leadership isn't internally as a manager or as, a, as an internal leader, but rather, how are you leading your clients? How are you moving them through a major liquidity event? How are you moving your clients through G1 to G2 wealth transference? How are you moving your clients through a process that otherwise they might not really understand because they've just become significantly more wealthy over the past few years or maybe because of one single event? And that those critical conversations are really important, not just in the asset management world, but certainly in the, uh, in the typical corporate world as well, Gordon. So <clears throat> corporate, family office. So you're, you're working kind of like with decision makers and leaders in large organizations as well as small organizations. The beauty of the way I've built out the practice is we get to choose basically uh, based on what we know the opportunity at hand is. So the process starts with a little discovery, figuring out what it is we could work on, whether there's really an interest on the you know, individual or the corporation's part, and whether I view it as worthwhile for me to get involved in, because of course, there's only so much bandwidth that each of us has over the next weeks, quarters, and, and year to devote to client work. So we kind of select based on what we know is a good fit and how we might have real impact. We certainly want to be measured by the impact we have and not just collect a fee every quarter. Mm -hmm. And so you know that I went through the strategic coach program. So I'm a big fan Great program. of coaching, personal development. It sounds like what you do is much more customized to the need of that individual rather than an institutionalized sort of program. Is that right? A lot of, a lot of props go out to strategic coach, everyone who's gone through it, the facilitators and coaches who still, you know, leverage that in their sessions. What I've done is I've taken the 13 years I had on the New York stock exchange trading floor as a managing director, as a trader in high, you know, 
uh, stress and uh, situations and negotiations. And I move that into how can I help people now that I've walked the walk, how can I help people go through similar analysis? How can I help them come out the other side with yes, a structure. So we do have a structure as you call it a little more institutionalized, but it is definitely customized and personalized based on the situation at hand and the goals that will really be meaningful for those individuals. Got it. Interesting. How do, how do potential clients come to you? How do they find you? What are they asking you for? Well, just the other day, I was at a, uh, I was at a very long endurance race. Uh, you know, it was a hundred miles. How many miles are you running nowadays, Gordon? Not a hundred. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And I'm, and I'm totally, and I'm totally blowing smoke. I, I do in no way would I run a hundred miles. I'm using that as a lead in because I know you are a machine when it comes to training for and executing on some pretty serious endurance events. And I'm just, I'm just an old school veteran. I, I got a few out of my system, but you picked it up at the, at the right young age that you are and yeah. you're slaying it. I don't, I can't leverage that market right now, unfortunately. Uh, most of them are referrals though. And I know you, you, uh, respect just how powerful a referral is, having done good work with one or several people, tapping into that their networks and finding other opportunities that are either similar or completely different is really a great way to grow a brand. And the last in nine years of building out, Polio has really been um, all attributable to, to and, uh, and because of the good graces of people who've introduced us to new opportunities. Networking, connections, referrals, all very powerful. My, my whole career has been built that way. And at least the lad, latter half of my career, the, the early half was struggle. <laughs> Traditional cold calling and all that nonsense. And I'm very grateful for all of the folks that have helped support me and my business and help it grow. So I totally understand where you're coming from. Sure. What does the uh, typical engagement look like in terms of uh, duration? Well, if it's an individual coaching situation, we usually commit for one to two quarters because we have specific goals that are going to take a few weeks or several sessions to really flesh out and reach a point where they feel like they've achieved some sort of growth or development that makes it uh, you know, a worthwhile experience. Many times that expands into, say, three quarters a year or even beyond. And sometimes there's no billing involved for a quarter or two because the relationship stays intact. The individual does what they need to. And then we communicate later on when they have another project or a specific uh, task or goal that they want to achieve. And they look to, to me or to the company to help them with that. On a group setting, those are typically programs we design with the client for the entire corporation, a leadership swath or uh, a subset of individuals in the corp. And then we roll that out to those individuals and it may end there, or it may be something that we just hit rewind and play on several times over different offices across the country. And previous to uh, you know the, the, the recent experience, it's taken us across the ocean in both directions. So uh, fortunately, large corporations truly believe in, in people skills and development of their people, the leadership, the management, the difficult conversations. And that's something that we're tapping into more and more, especially in the virtual realm that we're all still somewhat in day to day. Interesting. So you've mentioned a few times difficult conversations and critical conversations. And I know I'm looking, I'm trying to see the titles on the books behind your, behind you. I, I know, I know there was you more know, about- You've read several of them. I I'm sure, sure, I'm sure. I, I can see good to great. I'm sure I've read most yeah. of those on your shelf, but talk, let's talk about just critical conversations. How do you define them? What are they? How do you prepare for them? And why is like maybe preparing your mindset around critical conversations so important for business leaders? Good. So for the next hour, we'll answer those three questions and we'll keep everybody in suspense. <laughs> Do I hear the clock ticking as well? Is there a timer That's going right. on? <laughs> right. So critical conversations, I would say, typically show up as, uh, if we use an example, people like examples, you're, a, you're, an, you're an asset manager, you're a wealth manager, and you are moving from one brand to another, one shop, one bank, one, one, one house to another. And in doing so, you're going to need to move all your clients with you. That's usually what the deal is, whole, is right, predicated right. upon. In doing that, there are critical conversations that you must have. And as awkward as they might be, or as, as scripted as they have to be, they're critical to making sure that as many people as possible cross the bridge with you to your new home. And they view it in a way that's not simply, hey, 
Joe got a payday. And therefore, of course, he wants me to go with him because if I don't, it's going to diminish how much he's getting bought out for. And instead, they realize Joe's making a move that's going to increase his resources, increase his access to talent, and perhaps even increase the amount of focus he can give me as one of his investors or clients. And all of that needs to be articulated. It's a critical conversation before the announcement, before it hits the news wire that I'm making the move. Otherwise, people feel like they've been shortchanged. So the critical side of it is, is, is the importance and the fact that it's something that maybe needs a little more prep and rehearsal to make sure you execute flawlessly. Good explanation. And I think that um, what's critical for maybe people who are watching and listening to this is that I think a lot of us who are in leadership roles, oh, I got it, no problem, I got it. And then they don't got it and they end up on the wrong side of the equation and or they don't take over that whole book of business or right. they lose you know, those big clients because they didn't communicate properly. Um, and you so don't yes. have to be, you don't have to be bought out for that to show up, Gordon, you know, the drill, right. you said, got it, got it, don't got it. I call that the curse, curse of commission complacency. You know, your parents made maybe a hundred thousand or 150, 200,000, if you're in like my generation, and that was a really nice income. And now you're making 10, 15, whatever X of that, right. Several, de you know, decades later, and you feel comfortable. But what you don't realize is all of that is being looked at by the competition every day and while you're sleeping. So if you're not constantly making sure you're drawing those clients in closer, you're going deeper in those relationships, you're expanding into different corners of an institution that you maybe do business with or a network of people that you, that you share business and, and relationships with, you're going to find yourself backing down the ladder of success. And that complacency is going to be to blame. It's not because you didn't have the skills or the opportunity. It's that you took it for granted and thought it was going to just be there. And that's, that's, that happens every day. We know that we replace yeah. things with free time at home, the kids, leisure activities, golf, uh, boating, even endurance events. If we do too many of them and we take our eye off, you know, the, the, the clock in the office, that could be detrimental to our corporate health. Yep. So, uh, two key words or two key thoughts that I just came out of that was complacency. And then the second thing is, is that people know what they know. And, and often high wage earners, high commission earners, high, highly successful individuals, sometimes they don't want to admit that their sphere of knowledge is what it is. And uh, I, I would imagine that it may be at times difficult for you to explain to somebody who is a very high earner I can help you get through this situation because you may not know what you need to know to get through it. And I know you wouldn't word it that way, but sure. how do you have that kind of critical conversation around, let me help you get to the next level when somebody is already, you know, way up there. Yeah. I would, I would say that really is the secret sauce. And, and I, and I presume you might be serving it up there a little for me. It's, it's a, it's a dicey conversation to have. You have to have great bedside manner, but more importantly, you need to feel comfortable asking questions that elicit responses and do it in a way that is non-judgmental, that gives them the ability to get comfortable being vulnerable with you and not offer advice. See that when, when people hang out their shingle as a consultant or as an advisor, they feel the need to consult. They feel the need to advise right away. And I would say 90% of the time, you should have your mouth shut and your ears open and your pen or your fingers, you know, typing or writing furiously because you're absorbing what that person's sharing with you. And the more you ask questions like, well, so tell me what what has caused some struggle for you? Or tell me, Gordon, what's been difficult for you to go from where you are to the next level? They may not have even said anything about wanting to get to the next level, but now you put it out there as almost a presumption that they would want. And they're going to, in, in their you know, A personality, they're going to tell you, well, here's this, and I'm shorthanded here, and I don't have enough uh, resources there. And so then, well, let's unpack that. How might it be different? What other options could you explore? How do people you know who are getting it done? do it. And I ask the questions and all of a sudden an hour goes by. I've spoken three or four, maybe five times for a sentence or two, but they've given me all the keys to the kingdom. And at that point in time, I say, you know what, let's hit pause. I'm going to send you a letter that kind of, or an email that, that captures some of the things we uncovered today. Hopefully they resonate with you. You can tell me if I missed anything. Usually they don't. And we from there can decide what makes sense to work toward together 
if a relationship makes sense at all. That's and at true. that point in time, the individual knows that they're getting like value up front. I haven't run the meter, so they don't owe me anything. I'm giving them real feedback. Like this is a legit mirror here. It's not the fun house that makes you look pretty or skinny, right? And I did it in a way that's really gentle. So all of that articulates over uh, confidence and an authenticity that I believe is what wins the next relationship, the next opportunity, the next partnership with a client. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think for folks in, like you said, the consulting space, the advisory space, we're all salespeople to one degree or another. We may not want to admit that we're advisors. Um, we have a certain degree of knowledge, intellect, skill set that's probably greater than a lot of our clients because that's why they come to us. So our immediate reaction is like to just spill out as much free advice as we can. And when you get that as a, as a client, you get, um, you, you just don't get that comforting feeling like you're not getting listened to. So I think your approach is, is right on target. I often will say, you know, tell me what's important for you. If somebody presents a problem to me and I don't want to like solve their problem right away because like you, I get paid for the solutions I provide. And that is often a, an insurance or a risk product, but I don't want to offer that product unless they really understand what they need. And I'm sure it's the same for you and a lot of other advisors, but they have to understand the prospect or the client has to understand what's really in it for them, what's really important for them. What are the risks, opportunities, and threats that they face that they want to have mitigated? And that's what Gordon or Joe can help them work through. But it's getting them, I'm sure, like, like for the both of us, to that tipping point of understanding, I can help you because now we've identified what the real threats are, what the real issues are. There has to be an absolute need. And they've got to admit it. You've got to identify it and be clear on it. There has to be some sort of urgency because if it's something they've known for years and they've never done anything, guess what? I'm probably not going to be the person just like you won't be to get them to move off the stick or off the schneid. Right. Um, there has to be the ability to enact, meaning is there capital here or is this a person who's you know running on a razor thin budget and therefore maybe I'm not the person or you're not the person that they should seek the services of and they should look on, on you know, on the, on the budget pages and that's fine. Um, but ultimately if there's, if there's no opportunity and there's no real sense of urgency, even if there's money, even if they're super coachable, it's difficult to proceed, you know, and I, I would much rather have a very clearly defined uh, mission and s impact declared than have somebody who's like super coachable and agreeable. Cause a lot of people can be agreeable and coachable, but we're just going to be spinning around and spinning around, never achieving anything. Someone who wants to achieve something and it's very clear, but is a little stubborn. I can work with, and they can work with me. I can be more direct and they, then they'll take it as in a, in a respectful way because they know they're achieving what they need and what they want, even though that they're being a little, maybe selfish in the, in the manner. I, I can't imagine any high performing financial services person being stubborn. They Joe, come in all shapes here? and sizes. They come in all shapes and sizes. And sometimes I say, look, I, I can't give you an answer on that. Yeah. Right. And they, they want an answer. How would, well, how would you handle this? There's you benefit, sir, or ma'am, from much more backstory and peripheral view than I do. You're throwing a, a set of facts. What I can offer you, though, is how I might, if they press, what I can offer you is how I might analyze the situation. And that usually is what like backs someone off, someone who's a little bit more aggressive or wanting an answer right away. If I show them what my thought process is, you know, show your work. Here's the math that I would do if I knew how to do the math. Here's the formula that I would probably engage with. Then they can at least give me the partial credit and say, all right, he doesn't know. And he's telling me that, but he's also giving me a peek behind the curtain as to how he operates. And I like the logic. He clearly knows his stuff. It's worth the second meeting. That's mm -hmm. I've I've definitely heard that in the past um, as being the reason why we move forward uh, with a client or an opportunity. Interesting. Cool. Joe, I know you have an event coming up next month down in Florida. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I'm not I'm not proposing to pitch the whole thing, but no, I'm, no, I'm no. interested to no, know I more about you. what you do and, and how you do it. We're actually at capacity. It's an intimate event, Gordon. As you know, this isn't this isn't this 300 person, uh, you know, uh, boondoggle conference. We do, we are having an event down at PGA National. 
excuse me, we picked it because of the seasonality um, and the warm weather. We also picked it because of the brand new facilities they have down there and how accommodative they've been. Um, it is a, it is, it's a retreat. It's called Step Up to the Line. Okay. It's a program we've run and has had many incantations over the last five or six years with clients. Typically, the client is a corporation and they'll bring me in to do this with their leadership team or a subset of managers or a division. What we decided over the summer was we're going to we're going to host this for individuals and many of them in the room are going to be strangers never having met before. They'll all have some tangentiality to polio them when they arrive they're going to go through 48 straight hours, you know, with some sleep in between, but they're going to go through a retreat like they've never seen. So this isn't just a bunch of people talking at you and telling you what they've done and how great they are. Instead, there's a real structure in the middle that talks about the five competencies of wealth, which expand upon the bottom line wealth, number five, which is financial wealth. And they help everybody reframe how they set their goals, how they define their professional brand or even their personal brand. And ultimately it's going to fortify all their behaviors as they leave the retreat and go back to their home, their corporates, their, their locales. So it's a pretty cool event. We're excited about it. We do a full subscription for this one. We did a, we did a run with a, a group in no, at the end of November. And we've also actually now signed up for one day and two days off of this particular one with specific clients. So much like your experience in getting out there with podcasts and much more social presence, it's amazing what's going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. As people are, the timeline, the lead time to go from, I'm putting this out there as a service or a product and the buyers are lining up has been compressed. That timeline has been compressed, which is great. We're, we're getting access to all new markets that otherwise we may not have been able to penetrate before. That, that's a nice thing to have happen, I'm sure. Yeah, no doubt. You know, you know, like you said before, you know, the struggle early on, you know, when you when you create a new division or a new venture in, in your business, you want to make sure that it has just as much success as everything else. So it doesn't distract or diminish the brand to be met with a lot of interest early on is something that we count as a blessing. And we're very grateful for those who've, uh, you know, committed to participate in the upcoming sessions. With that in mind, do you have plans for more events like that during the course of 2022? We do. We have tentative dates. One of them got filled out. Uh, it was taken out completely by one particular client. So they wanted to send multiple people. And I said, look, I'd really rather have it be unique individuals, not, you know, four velociraptors from Acme International coming in and just, you know, destroying the whole room. Uh, so they said, no problem. Well, what do we need? And I said, 12 people. I could run this for 12 people. Give me two days and we'll, we'll knock it out of the park for your group. So we're, we moved that date. We assigned it to a particular client. We have another one lined up in February. And then we have one offs of several cities, including New York, probably Westchester County, because New York is becoming very difficult to operate in. But Westchester County and, um, and suburban affluent suburban areas around the metro uh, metropolitan of New York, Pennsylvania, and uh, Boston. We're going to have those out in the next few months. So the first quarter is going to be very busy for us here, for sure. That's cool. Um, for anybody listening or watching, do you want to just, and I'll also put it in the show notes, do you want to give us uh, where they could find out and get maybe on a mailing list or uh, keep an eye on what these dates are going to look like? Do you want to give us where that they can find that info? I appreciate the uh, the opportunity for that. The website's pretty easy, polioinc.com. That's P like Peter, A-L-I-O, inc.com. And you can just rummage through the website to learn about the company, to engage with us, see what things we do with others and what they've said about that experience. There's a couple of videos on there that'll explain a little more, the step up to the line retreat. And there's an opportunity, like you said, to sign up um, and communicate with us. There's... Uh, posts that we send, emails, uh, little tidbits, Monday morning meditations that go out before you know, most people wake up on Monday. Yeah, we try to keep uh, keep in front of our, our, our troop or our team as best as we can on a weekly basis. Great, thanks. Um, what about ongoing support? So somebody goes to a retreat, is there a component of ongoing support or is that then a, um, a new engagement with you to continue the dialogue? Sure. This is great. Uh, we designed the retreats themselves to include the accountability component. That accountability component takes the 12 to 16 members of the cohort, breaks them up into fours because it's a little easier to manage schedules once everyone's back home in smaller groups. And we get together at the two week interval, the four week interval, and then of course at the 60 and 90 days as well, because a lot of people wanna have some sort of check-in as time goes on. 
Back in the day when I was cutting my teeth, Gordon, in this business, when I transitioned from the stock exchange, I, um, I noticed that there was a huge uptick in absorption, reception, and even productivity after we did a program with someone, whatever the topic, the subject matter was. And then there was a huge fall off within even like two weeks after. Yeah. And it's all because of the continuation you're talking about, the continuation training. So having those accountability measures put out and staked into the calendar when we when we break from the retreat is important. But even on an individual basis with my coaching clients, we make sure that I make sure that they know they're committing to like weekly sessions. We can move the session. I understand everybody's got a lot going on, and especially now we have to juggle many different things. So we can move it but it's got to be in the calendar because otherwise it's never going to get done. And it's very important to just at least have that date that we can slide forward or back a day or an hour and make sure we continue to honor the time together. Otherwise it's going to be difficult to ever achieve our goals. Yeah. Life gets in the way very quickly. It's all good. And then we become complacent because life's pretty good for a lot of people. And the people that we're trafficking with typically are business owners, our entrepreneurs, our, you know, stakeholders or, or, you know, have received some wealth in their life at some point. And now they're like, ah, do I want to push any harder? Well, inflation alone might be the uh, stimulus for you to push a little bit harder because who knows if that dollar is going to even be worth a dime in a few years, the way they keep printing. <laughs> All right. Let's not scare anybody here, Joe. <laughs> no, no, no. That could get a whole, that could get a whole bunch of other people calling into the program though. Do we have, can we go to the phones right now? Just set up like uh... <laughs> We can go to the videotape, but no phones. <laughs> there we go. All right, let's just take a two-second break. Um, sure. <clears throat> what would you like to cover that we haven't already talked about? Anything? If you can let me go for a minute and a half, two minutes on five competencies of wealth, you could say you mentioned you know, that the, the structure of the, the retreat is built about this five competencies of wealth. You want to just okay. give us the quick and dirty on it. That would be okay. great. Good. So Joe, earlier you mentioned the five competencies of wealth uh, that kind of perked my ears up a little bit. Can you give us a little detail on what that's all about? Sure. Well, let me start off by calming you. You definitely have attained all five competencies. <laughs> I, know you, I know you well enough. So as I go through them, you're going to go, wow, that was nice. There is a true compliment in there, but it's an acknowledgement, Gordon, of how you live and how you built your world with your family, with you know your network and, and your business. So Everybody knows the financial wealth. That's the easy one, right? That's the bottom line. So that's number five. Number one for me, and I put them in this order, number one for me in the priority is family. So those are the people that love you, the people that you love, the ones that you spend the most time with. They don't necessarily have to be blood. They could be your peeps or your homies, but they're your family. And family wealth comes in the form of, is everyone pulling for you? Are you cheering for them? Is there positivity abound? Or is it a negative environment? Is it stressful? Is there a divorce afoot? You know, something that could derail the ultimate accumulation of the bottom line, which is financial wealth. Second competency has to do with wealth of health. Well, we, we all are very keenly aware of our health, our physical health, right? And even our mental health as we've gone through this pandemic for two years and then as it prolongs in many places even deeper to this day. That health as well as maybe spiritual health and environmental health all play a part in how well we can achieve that bottom line financial wealth. It also plays a part in what our stresses are on our family. So you see how they're starting to be interconnected. The third competency I would say is cultural wealth. And that has to do with intellectual stimulation and lifestyle stimulation. Many people in the last two years have taken advantage of uh, buying a course on how to do something or watching and taking up maybe a podcast and delivering a podcast. And that has beefed up not just their professional profile, but it's also felt them, made them feel good because they've enhanced their intellectual capacity. So that cultural stimulation, that cultural competency is very important. And if we don't have any of it, then why are we grinding so hard to make the bottom line dollar? The fourth one is social wealth. And the competency around expanding our social wealth has to do with, do we live in two different worlds? Like, are we two different people where I'm Joe at home and I'm Joe on LinkedIn? Or is the Joe on LinkedIn that everybody knows professionally very much the Joe at home with his five girls, hashtag girl dad, and very much the Joe when he's 
out, uh, you know, playing golf or tennis with friends or, or kayaking with a, with a client to get to know them on the water where they can't get away, you know, too fast without a, with a speedy breaststroke. Um, so are those the same person? And that social competency is something that many people neglect. They, they're almost like one person when they're at home or near home, and then a completely different person in the workplace. Many of us have been forced to smash those two together during the work from home era, but not necessarily all of us. So addressing all four of those, the family, the health, the cultural and the social helps us keep in check that maybe sometimes the financial wealth is not as flowing as it always is, but each of those accounts are gaining and amassing wealth. And therefore we feel very good and satisfied. And maybe sometimes we're starting to deplete a little bit on family, but our finances are, you know, top notch. And now we're going to have to shift some of that focus back toward the family or toward, or toward our physical health. So how they interplay with each other and why those five, five core competencies matter so much is really the beginnings of truly setting goals for the year ahead, the many years ahead, and also identifying what your brand is, as opposed to simply saying, I want to generate this much revenue this year. I want to add this many clients to my book. What's it all for? How does it impact your family? How's it going to impact your health? Or is it not? How does it consider your cultural stimulation? Or does it not? And so those are the conversations that come out in the retreat. And they all are centered upon the, uh, the five competencies of wealth. Very powerful. Um, thank you for sharing that. It, it's um, Thank you, for any, Gordon. You know, for anybody who's watching or listening, um, I'm sure that as Joe was going through all five, they were saying to themselves, okay, I, I'm really good there, or I really suck there, or maybe I need to come to some agreement between um, health and, and family and money. And, you know, nobody, everybody would love to think, oh, I'm doing great on all five bullet points. The truth of the matter is, is that when we're really honest, authentic with ourselves, we're not, and that's okay. Um, and that gives us something to look forward to, to measure against, to kind of grow into. I remember many years ago doing um, a workbook. Uh, I might be getting it right. I might be getting it wrong. Darren Hardy, best year ever. And he had like a circle graph. And many of your five points were on this circle graph. It was, you know, health, social, family, fitness, you know, spiritual. And you had to rank yourself on each of these. And we're you know, where you are and where you want to be. Um, and that's what goal setting is all about. And I just actually listened to somebody the other day say, yeah, you can set a goal for 2022 to make this much money. But if you don't understand why you want to make that much money or why it's important or how it's going to impact your family or your health, you'll never reach that goal because these things are so intertwined with each other. And I think... Really, that's the message you were trying to, not trying to get to, you did get to, that these are ultimately connected. You can't detract or you can't detach one from the other and expect to be phenomenal at one thing and, and or phenomenal at all things, right? The, the, analogy I like, the analogy I like to use, Gordon, is, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, the analogy I like to use, Gordon, is when you're driving a car, are you in a complete panic if your tire pressure should be 30 30 pounds per square, but it goes down to like 25? Not really. You're probably continuing your trip. You're evaluating what important calls or meetings do I have next? And can I make it through the day with 25 pounds before I go to the shop and either refill it or see if there's a, a screw in it and get it plugged? Similar with gas. The needle goes down to E. I'm okay. I know, I know I can get home. I know I, I've got a busy rest of the afternoon. It's all local. I could still get home. And then tomorrow morning, I've got an hour free before my first call. I can go get gas, fill up, and I'll be good to go. Same thing with wiper fluid. Wiper fluid's low. It's no problem operating the vehicle with low wiper fluid, low gas, and a little bit of a leak and air pressure in your tire. But if you're going to go, if you're going to go high speed and you're going to go for a long time, and you're going to be between service stations with no off ramp and you've got kids in the back, young kids, you're probably going to make sure that the tires are all full at the right pressure and they're all clear of any, you know, punctures. You're full of gas and you've got, you know, enough wiper fluid. 
all of that is what we're talking about. You know, if, if you got to neglect the family a little bit for a week because you have a major deliverable, the family knows. But do you tell them at least? Are you, are you sharing with them? And can they support you in that endeavor by getting out of your way so you can focus on the task at hand? Yes, they can, as long as it's not really 10 years of you focusing on the task at hand and you don't know what your kids eat for breakfast. Uh, similarly, you can look at all the other areas. So that's how, that's how we like to share it. I, I like your analogy of the automobile. I can remember as a kid, we did a lot of travel by car and travel trailer. And I think it was crossing like um, Death Valley or some desert. Wow. And my dad's like, oh, we got plenty of gas. My mom was like, are you sure we've got enough <laughs> gas? <laughs> so yeah. I'd add to your kind of analogy, having a good co-pilot is kind of critical in life. <laughs> Certainly, certainly. Yeah, I could even add that that might be the role there when people say, I've got it on my own, perhaps the voice of reason, you know, it depends on how and, and it's not what you say, but how you say it, perhaps your mother or somebody interjecting, you know, you from the backseat, hey, dad, <laughs> um, you know, it'd be great to get a burger here. It looks like this is a good burger joint, which is really the clue for the, the hint for like, we don't want to be stuck in the desert without gas in the car. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And in the good old days, your dad could just reach around and smack you. <laughs> that's that's true. That was still that was still allowed, although we can't endorse that. Uh, exactly. That's not the purpose of the conversation for sure. Fantastic, Joe. I want to be respectful of your time. It's been a fantastic conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? I hope that I can add to the mix for 2022 as much impact as you've had in reaching to people bringing them into not just the show and helping them feel like their platform is expanding and growing because they're part of it, but also because of the energy you bring. It was awesome to connect with you in the city, Gordon, and see you live and just feel the vibe of who you are as a person, the positive energy, the outlook, and to hear about you knocking down these endurance events is just fantastic. I mean, it really is a testament to people who can be super successful professionally you know, buttoned up and organized, not complete, not a complete mess, <laughs> have their family life in order, and also have some real meaningful and, and healthy habits and, uh, and pastimes in their private life. So thanks so much for doing all the great stuff you're doing for having me on the show. Well, it's very complimentary. And I appreciate it, Joe. You're very kind. Um, if people wanted to get in touch with you, how's the best way to do that? Sure. Uh, through the website, again, uh, polyoink.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram under uh, at polyoink, all one word. And I would say I'm fairly transparent. So all else fails, use the Google machine and, and search up Joe Greco Polio and, and I'll come right up. <laughs> Great. And I'll also put those contact points in the show notes so people who may be on the treadmill or driving or whatever, we'll be able to get them at a later date. Joe, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I appreciate all of the positivity you've delivered to the, the folks who are listening and watching to this uh, episode. It's been a great conversation and, and I really appreciate you and everything that you do. Thanks so much for having me. All right, we'll see you soon. You got hey, it. I'm Gordon Coyle. If you have an interesting story you'd like to tell on this podcast, reach out to me as well. My info will be in the show notes. Love to chat and get you on the show as well. Take care.